I can't even believe they admitted that to me. I appreciate the transparency, but at the same time, it's kind of like WTF. The downfall of ThriftCon. Let's talk about it. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kennedy. I'm a vintage curator and seller. I run a business called Retro Rags. Um, I've been doing this since 2018. It's black owned, women owned, and a one man show by yours truly. I will leave my socials here on the screen if you want to follow along. Um, but anyway, we're talking about ThriftCon today because you know what? I'm just gonna keep it 100. I am not a happy camper. I don't, I don't get it. I don't know why people do this logistically it's just not adding up <laughs> and we need to talk about it because I feel like they make it look so much fun um and lit and they make you feel special and it's like once you actually get to do it you're kind of like there's no way this is what people are talking about this is not what they were hyping up right like I don't know and before you guys come for me in the comments I didn't technically have like a bad weekend by any means I sold over 130 things um I made all my money back and then some. It's just like an expectations versus reality. And I've heard so many stories about ThriftCon and this year it was just not it. I don't know. The one year I actually get to do it, it just did not live up to the hype. So let's get into it. Okay, so vendor fees, let's start there because that's where this all began. Um, if you wanted to be a 10 by 10, you had to pay $500 for your spot. If you wanted to have a 15 by 15, which is what I chose, it was $1,000. And if you wanted to have a 20 by 20, it was a whopping $2,000 just for your space for two days. Um, in the past, ThriftCon has only been one day, but I don't know what happened. They decided one day is not enough anymore. Let's make it two. So this year, it's a two-day event. Um, when I did ThriftCon Charlotte in December, um, which I have a whole video on that, and I wasn't too happy about it that situation either so if you want to watch that i'll put it up here um but what was i about to say oh for charlotte i paid 500 for my 15 by 15 and then for this one it was 1000 i just you know as insane as it is i was like it's fine it's two days now that makes sense i paid 500 for one day one plus one equals two like i should pay 200 i mean not 200 two oh my god one thousand dollars for two days goodness it is morning time so i'm still waking up but that part made sense so i was like okay as astronomically high and insane as this is if it lives up to the hype it's worth it okay um but that's not all <laughs> i also paid for this thing called a patreon membership with this membership, if you get like their highest tier membership, it basically like guarantees your spot at ThriftCon. Um, it's called like Grails and it's $75 a month. It's technically like 81 after taxes and fees and everything. And essentially, if you were a part of this membership, you get early access to the application and it guarantees your spot at ThriftCon. And then you're also supposed to get like a premier preferred like spot at ThriftCon as well. Um, which considering ThriftCon typically sells out within like two, three minutes, it's super hard to get into. Sometimes, you know, it's kind of worth it. In my opinion, this was worth it. I didn't want to have to deal with the stress of not getting in to ThriftCon. So I did pay to play. Um, essentially that doesn't sound great, but that's what it was like you were paying so that you didn't have to like deal with the stress of possibly not getting in. Um, and so I started paying for that in November so I could get into ThriftCon, um, Charlotte in December. And then I was like, Atlanta's in March, so I might as well just keep it because I know the application is going to drop in February. So I kept my Patreon membership. So I paid for it for a total of four months and that added up to be $324. So really for my spot at ThriftCon, I paid $1,300 for two days. That is more than I pay for rent. <laughs> Saying that out loud sounds so crazy. I'm telling you, sometimes you just need to hear some stuff out loud and like really break it down. And you're like, yo, why is anybody paying this much just to be part of a market like logistically it just doesn't make sense but anyway starting there um th those were the fees and that did not include the fact that i had to travel so i'm from alabama this was in atlanta so i did have to pay for gas on the way out there while i was out there and then on my way back 
Um, I had to get a hotel for two nights because setup was on Friday. And then the first day of ThriftCon was Saturday. And then the second day of ThriftCon was Sunday. So um, I had to get a hotel room for um, Friday night and Saturday night. That didn't include food. That didn't inclu include cost of goods. So if you're like doing the math at minimum, just with like travel, the booth, the Patreon membership, um, in the hotel, I'm sitting at like $1,700 in the hole before I even set up. I'm sitting at $1,700. Oh, your jaw is probably on the floor. It needs to be <laughs> surgically put back on your face. Um, yeah. <laughs> am I crazy? Yes, I am. But like people in the past, specifically at ThriftCon Atlanta, because it is notoriously like the second best location. Um, it's usually like Denver and then Atlanta. Sometimes Houston does a little bit better than Atlanta, um, but it's always in like the top three cities year after year. So it's been crazy. I had friends in the past who have done 12K in one day, 10K in one day. Like people were saying at minimum in the very back corner, they could still do $4,000 like easily in one day after I've gone. So in my head, by those numbers, if I'm spending, you know, nearly two thousand dollars before i even set up it, it it's not that big of a deal it's like high risk high reward but unfortunately this was like high risk and not enough reward it was just not adding up and it's kind of just like you have to sit back and think where is my money going like what am i actually paying for because <laughs> I've done a market in that exact same expo center and it was also a two day market. Um, in my vendor fee, granted I did do a 10 by 10 at that you know market, but um, my vendor fee for that was $170 for two days. I went back and looked at my email for that other market that was in April of last year with a different company. Um, I paid $170 for a 10 by 10 for two days. ThriftCon is charging the 10 by 10 people $500 for two days. And like at that market, all the booths were 10 by 10. So even though they had like 250 vendors at that one, um, it still added up to be so much less money than what ThriftCon is charging like and what they're getting for vendor fees. I did the math and not even including all the booths because some of the booths, I couldn't tell what sizes they were based off the map that they gave us. But like at minimum, ThriftCon brought in $144,000 just off vendor fees alone. And that wasn't even counting all of their booths. And if you kind of like looked around at ThriftCon, it's, it was like, this is not giving high production like at all. So it's just kind of like, where's my money going? Because we didn't even get like our free t-shirt anymore, which sounds stupid to be upset about, but how come we're paying more and getting less? You know what I mean? Um, because before we would get a free t-shirt, it was like our little prize. And now all we get is like this little wristband that says you were a vendor, ThriftCon 2024, like cool, but I'd rather have like a t-shirt. And when we asked them like, hey, are we getting t-shirts this year? They were like, no, we're not doing that. But um, they were like, no, we're not doing lineup tees anymore. We partnered with like a designer and you can get 50% off um, if you're in the Patreon, which the only benefit to being in that Patreon, honestly and truthfully, is to get your vendor spot guaranteed without the stress. Like, I don't care about ThriftCon merch. And it's like, I already gave you guys $1,000 plus. Why am I now having to pay for this t-shirt? And I only get a discount if I continue to be part of that membership, which means continuously gave you my money so that I could get a discount on a t-shirt that I used to be able to get for free. It's just like not adding up. Um, I did make a video on this on like TikTok um, and I did fill out the survey and I told them all the feedback that I'm telling you guys right now. Um, but after I made my TikTok video, they did reach out to me and they sent me an email basically trying to address all my concerns and like make me feel at ease. So I'm gonna read you this email throughout my explanation just so you can hear their answers to some of my questions 
Um, so obviously I was talking about the fees and everything. So in the experience, cause that also wasn't adding up because we were like on day one during setup, you drove up, they gave you a vendor packet, which had nothing but like a contain or container. It was an envelope full of just like five of these. That was it. Um, and they were just like, you can go around to the back park and then start unloading. And like, that was it. There was no other instruction. I couldn't find anybody that worked for ThriftCon on setup day that was helping like organize anything. It really just felt like a free for all. At one point I got blocked in because the parking situation was insanity. Like my car was blocked in. I could not even leave the event even though I was done setting up because people had blocked me in and I could not find the people who owned these cars to like move or anything. Like during the event, did they come and say like, hey, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Is there anything I can get you? Like ThriftCon is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's not including setup or takedown. That's the amount of time we're working. That is a full like nine to five regular day. And like at no point did they come and ask if we needed like water or snacks or anything. Like they didn't talk to us after the event. They didn't come around and address any like concerns like check-in there was like just no level of care at all but anyway um so the first part of the email they outlined some stuff for me um so in regards to my concern about like the vendor fees and experience they i'm going to summarize it but they said we knew going into 2024 that the sudden jump in booth fees was going to be drawing for vendors and understandably so but in order to increase the event to a two-day event uh, or two-day weekend, the fees needed to represent that shift, which, like I said, it made sense to me. Like, that was the least of my concerns. Um, they said the reality of these types of events um, have all kinds of costs associated with vendors don't really see on their end. Their staff, security, freight, design, warehousing, even little things like those wristbands, curtains, marking tape, etc. add up quick. <laughs> And I understand that, but it's like they don't realize we also have a bunch of like hidden fees that they like don't take into account. And at least with them, they have multiple forms of income. They have the Patreon memberships, they have ticket sales, they have merch sales, they have vendor fees. Like they have so many forms of income. Like I said, at minimum, they made $144,000 just off of um, our vendor fees. That doesn't include all the people that were in that Patreon. That doesn't include... The fact that they had over 10,000 ticket sales, which tickets were $20 minimum. 20 times 10,000, like that's nearly $200,000. So like, I understand that there's a lot of fees, but at the same time, like you're raking in the money. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to hear. Um, then they also said, um, Instagram's new, uh, this is the part that really made me mad. Instagram's new update has also increased marketing costs by an insane amount over the past year. To get 10,000 plus people into the building is not a small investment and unpaid organic marketing is pretty much non-existent these days on the app. Our likes and views have cratered since this update. Now, this one really made me mad because how do they think the rest of us feel we all had to adapt all businesses had to adapt to the instagram change we understand that we get that but as a small business we don't have the money to just shell out thousands of dollars to instagram to push our stuff and if you like look at their instagram and the videos they post they're like high production but that's not even what people want on social media like they that's not what people want to see and it's just like obviously you can get reach because I didn't even tag them in my video on TikTok and it's at 25,000 views and growing but they found it so obviously I was getting reach I've had plenty of videos do 1 million views like as a small business not paying for it so it's just like I don't know why they're trying to tell me oh unpaid organic reach is impossible yes it is at that point you need to be the money you spend to promote should just enhance the reach it should not do all the work for you. And in my email response back to them, like I was telling them literally all of this and I told them, you know, maybe instead of shelling out thousands and thousands of dollars to Instagram, put that towards hiring someone who works in social media specifically so that they can come up with a strategy 
and make this actually worth your money. Because they're right. They have 142,000 people following them. And they're getting like 800 likes on their posts. Occasionally they get a little over a thousand, but with that many people, that engagement is terrible. They're not wrong, but obviously using this money is not helping them. Um, and it's like, also there are so many other ways to market. They only rely on Instagram, which is just, in my humble opinion, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, because one, not everybody's on Instagram, okay? And it's like old school marketing works just fine. You can get a billboard. You can get, you can email um, like a file to all the people who have storefronts here in Atlanta. They can print stuff out. They can put them on college campuses. They can put them around the city. Um, they can put them in the bags when people check out at their store. Like there are so many ways to reach people and to like get people to your market. There are other ways to do marketing other than just like giving, who owns uh, Mark Zuckerberg? Is that who it is? Meta, whoever, who owns Instagram? Instead of just giving them thousands and thousands of dollars and complaining that you still have no reach, like look for other outlets. They could have made an event on Facebook um, and had people RSVP. There's an older demographic on Facebook. They have money. These little college kids that keep trying to like cater to, they, they have a finite amount of money, okay? Like they, they maybe have a job, but like they're still a college student at the end of the day. They only have so much money. And thrift cons for everyone. You see people from literal babies to like your grandma's age at thrift cons. So why not take advantage of every possible market? You don't know who's in to your event who would be into vintage if you only are on instagram so that like really made me mad i understand marketing can get expensive but like there's a technique and a strategy that goes with this and so to sit there and tell me like oh part of the reason we charge you guys so much is because we don't know how to use social media and we don't know how to market to people that just kind of feels like bs in my humble opinion um anyway let's move on because that as you can see got me really heated um it says, a two-day event was also non-negotiable in terms of safety. My emails last year consisted of vendors saying that it was too packed and um, it created unsafe aisles and encouraged theft. This year, the emails were different. I didn't get as many saying that anybody was overwhelmed and I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed on the floor. Even though it felt like less, there was actually a lot more, if that makes sense. Theft still happened at this event. I had stuff stolen from my booth. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, during day one, three people had someone break. I don't know if it was the same person, but three different vendors on day one walked out after the event to find out that their U-Hauls were broken into and they were robbed. Someone else had their window smashed in their car and they were robbed. So it's just like they were talking about having safety and security. I didn't see one security guard walk around during that entire event. And clearly no one was outside watching our cars in the parking lot because people were still getting robbed outside and inside. The only authority I saw were fire marshals walking around to make sure there was nothing in the aisles so that if we needed to evacuate, we could. But other than that, it's just like, Now let's talk about why people didn't feel overwhelmed. The real reason, because these aisles were not the reason, okay? All right, so now that we're done with talking about fees and the lack of care that they gave um, and why I don't feel like it was worth the $1,000, um, let's get into why the vendors no longer felt overwhelmed. Well, uh, ThriftCon this year decided to get a new sponsor, called Vintage Supply. Vintage Supply is basically a glorified Goodwill bins. It is a vintage by the pound. When you walked into this arena or this expo center, first of all, it looks very dead <laughs> in there. There's so much dead space and openness. It kind of just gives the feeling like you walk into a bar and everyone's standing against the wall. 
why is where is everyone like that's the energy it was giving it was not a good first impression and like people on my video on tiktok like just buyers and guests not even vendors they commented on that and like yeah it did not look good i noticed how empty it was when i walked in that's never what you want to hear like people are paying to get into this event like they should get a welcoming me a welcoming feeling right off the bat and that's not what was happening but anyway back to this vintage by the pound thing you walk in, the first thing you see to your left are these bins. And they are just full. And you got to go over there. They give you a giant bag. I'm talking like the size of a 10 gallon trash bag type bag. And you got to go in, you got to dig. And for however long you wanted, you got to dig in there. And fill up your little bag, go up, weigh it, and pay. I personally don't think people realize how clothes, how heavy clothes can get. And how heavy they really are a pair of jeans especially vintage ones can easily be over two pounds the ones that are like 100 percent cotton that heavy durable long-lasting denim can be over two pounds that's an easy 20 dollars plus on just one pair of jeans and i'm telling you these bags were full and you don't realize it till you get up the front you're weighing your items and they're like okay it's gonna be 250 dollars and you're looking at your bag and you're like what that was their whole budget just blown right there everyone went to these goodwill bins they were swarming it like a moth to a flame and you could stay in there for as long as you wanted there was no time on it so you could just stay in there for hours if you wanted dig 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 fill up your bag pay for it and then you leave mind you this is all before they even see a curated vendor makes my eye twitch and so now they've blown nearly their whole budget on this vintage by the pound thing. Now they're walking around, they're coming to us and like, well, why would I pay $30 for this when I just got seven things for $30 over there? Which is a lie. They don't conceptualize. That's not what happened. But it's just like, why did we put so much time and effort and energy, months, weeks, prepping, finding our best inventory for this market if everyone was just gonna shop at this vintage supply thing and not have a budget left to shop with anybody else. I paid that extra $324 to be in the front and to get more sales, like, because I was at the front. And then y'all put this vintage by the pound thing in the front? It felt like the biggest slap in the face. Like, what are we doing? Did you guys think about the sellers when you made this decision? There's just no way. Mind you, this is this is like the second vintage by the pound thing. They already had a different one at ThriftCon Charlie, and it was still at this event too. So there were two different vintage by the pound like activations, experiences at this place. Except one was in the back on the in the corner, which made sense to me. And the other one was front and center. It literally stole so much business from the rest of the vendors. And I thought that was really messed up. Um, so let's see what they said about that. Okay. So this part about empty space and booth placement. They said some of our venues are really... <laughs> okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's back up for a second. Um, remember when I said there was all that dead space in the beginning? And I was like, when you walk in, like, it's kind of like, where is everybody up? Okay, so also with that, <laughs> they ended up having to refund some of the, the vendors because of their poor planning and layout. They refunded like eight vendors, $125 each for their poor placement. This is supposed to be like the biggest vintage market in the United States. And vendors are getting shafted. This is not the first year they've been at this location. Um, I don't know. It just kind of feels like there was a lack of planning that went into this. Like, why are people getting refunded? Why are you moving them literally two days before this actual event gets started? And you basically put them in a hallway they were disconnected from the rest of like everyone else. And it got to the, like some of these people were Patreon members too. So they literally paid extra money to guarantee their spots. 
and to have a preferred um, location for their booth and they still got shafted. Like one girl, she was literally supposed to have a 15 by 15. They're like, hey, sorry, like we had to move you. Um, so you no longer have a 15 by 15, you now have a 10 by 15. And it literally turned into a hallway because it wasn't 15 feet wide and 10 feet deep. It was 15 feet deep, long ways and only 10 feet wide. So it literally looked like she was working down a hallway all of her racks were just lined up on the side and it was just like this long pathway it was the weirdest thing you could barely hear music over in that area which in my opinion i think music and like the overall environment does impact you know sales and mentality when people are shopping so it was kind of crazy and also they put the pit people in the front and if you don't know what the pit is it's essentially like this long area where different people can come set up without having to pay. So they essentially bring in these big bags of their like specialty items and they'll lay them on the floor and they can just sit there and sell their stuff. Now in the past, um, this was something they just had to pay like a ticket to get in and then they could have all their stuff set up. Some of these t-shirt bros especially are bringing in like $800 t-shirts, $1,000 t-shirts, like they're bringing in their highest ticket items. And if they're selling that to other people looking for those specialty items, they could have easily just paid $20 and now they're up over, you know, a thousand or 2000, which I think is crazy. And they literally say like, oh, it's like the best way to sell your stuff without the commitment of getting a booth. That's crazy to me. Um, but now they're making, you know, if you want to be part of the pit, you do have to pay a hundred dollars, but still you paid a hundred dollars to sell your highest ticket items. And the people who paid $500 plus are getting shafted. They got thrown off to the side because you guys are in the front. Why couldn't we put those people in the front and the pit people in the back? The pit people are paying $100. These other people are paying 500 plus. They should be in the front. There's some other people who have these 10 by 10s. I kid you not, they were borderline in the parking lot. Like the bay doors and like where we were loading in, I kid you not, they were maybe 15 feet from that. And the entrance for Thrift Con was all the way over here and they are all the way in this back corner. And yet the pit people were still smack in the front. They paid $100 to sell. What? Okay, anyway. Now, now let's get into the response. It's gonna be about booth placement and then also that vintage by the pound thing, so. As far as the empty space and booth placement, um, they said some of our venues are really demanding to work with in terms of design. There are a lot of strange areas that get overlooked on blueprints and we have to be sure that the scale is right before we can even start placing booths. We live in Denver, so all communications with the venue are basically FaceTime or email. You heard that, FaceTime or email. We also have to work with the fire department and city regulations to make sure everyone has emergency access and safety aisles for the sake of customer safety flow and now main stage activation which i will touch on that um, we have to make sure we have room up front um what does that say maximizing space sometimes comes at a cost of what seems like common sense placement and those beams are everywhere. It's kind of hard to work around. We've also come to realize that we've outgrown this venue and we are actively searching elsewhere for um, the vin or We're actively searching for somewhere different for the years moving forward. But yeah, we did offer partial refunds to some of the vendors who we feel got shafted a bit. And then they had the nerve to say, location doesn't necessarily impact sales as much as vendors like to think. But in terms of these particular ones, we did feel like they got a pretty lame spot and not up to standard that we like to offer. So let's unpack that because there's a lot to unpack. So because they live in Denver, they basically planned everything over FaceTime. Because that makes sense. At no point could they have flown to Atlanta, looked at the venue, taken two days to walk around, do all their planning, and then fly back. At no point they could have done that. This date has been on the books since the end of 2023. 
we didn't do this until the end of March. You're telling me at no point you could have flown down, looked at the venue, planned everything out, and then flown back. You guys call yourselves the largest vintage market in the United States and you planned everything out through FaceTime and you did it so poorly that you ended up having to shaft some of the vendors who paid you hundreds of dollars. And now you refunded all of them $125 and it was eight of them. I don't know the exact math, but I know 100 times eight is 800. So they spent nearly a thousand dollars refunding when they could have just spent a solid 300 flying down to Atlanta, planning everything out and then flying back. Where's the level of care? This is what I'm talking about when I'm like, the experience is not worth the amount of money that we're paying. We paid this much money and they thought they could do everything through FaceTime. And they're using the excuse of living in Denver as the reasoning for their poor planning no, ma'am. No, sir. I can't even believe they admitted that to me. I appreciate the transparency, but at the same time, it's kind of like WTF. What else did they say? I understand the aisle safety. I get that. Um, and also, as far as the dead space goes in the front, again, I've seen years past. The booth started way sooner then they started this year. They were so off to the side this year. It felt empty. They And it's just like, you guys have been coming here for at least three, four years. So if you got the pass from the state and fire regulations all those other years, like why is there so much dead space this year? And that's when they mentioned the main stage activation. So one of my other vendor friends like reached out to them and asked them about like why there was so, so much open space. Um, and they are now trying to create a music festival experience environment. They feel like each year they need to do more and more to get people in the door. And so now they're going for a music festival experience. They want to bring in high profile talent, which this year they brought in, um, this producer called Zaytoven. Apparently he's worked with like Future and some other rappers. I don't really know. Um, they brought him in on Sunday. Luckily, it was just at the end from four to five. Because when I tell you the moment he went on, that was the only time I ever saw that area of front remotely full. And even then, people were over there with their phones out and they were dancing and stuff, but they weren't even shopping. So it's like, again, are you thinking about your sellers when you when you want this music festival thing? Because if you want to be a music festival, be a music festival. But at the end of the day, this is supposed to be a vintage market. That's what you started out as. Why are we straying away from the original plot of the movie? We pay too much for you to bring in a concert so that people are at the concert and not shopping with us. I'm getting worked up. <laughs> but it's just like, this. I pay too much money for you to be doing this to me and screaming me over like this and you have no problem with it. That's crazy. That That's freaking crazy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why they had so much open space and that's um, why they ended up refunding people because they were trying to do everything through FaceTime because that's logical. Yeah, why fly down to properly plan and avoid bad PR? when you could just be lazy and do everything through FaceTime, have to refund people, lose more money than you would have if you would have just flown out here. It, let's move on. Okay, back to the vintage by the pound thing. That was smack in the front, might I add. And again, screwed over the sellers because the care is not in the room with us right now. Okay, so as far as the vintage by the pound situation, they said, since ThriftCon began, the number one technique we hear from guests is the prices are entirely too high for a thrift convention, which they put in quotation marks. Um, for a thrift convention to even make sense to the general public, we have to invite, we have to provide an entire range of pricing from the super deals to high end um, collectibles. The buy the pound booth has become one of the most popular activations on the floor for that reason alone, the pricing. Then they put in parentheses and sells a lot more tickets to get bodies in the door. 
that sounds like it benefits you, ThriftCon. I'm trying to see where that benefits the sellers who paid you to be here. Um, then they go on to say, it isn't premium and it's not curated. It's all stained, worn, rag has stuff um, that people buy to fix and flip or spend the extra time on them to make them usable. It's just an added experience for the people to see what the culture is all about, which I guess they mean sourcing. Interesting. Um, they said uh, they do, this. these experiences do well and bring in the bodies, but we've also heard concerns from vendors and we won't be asking Benches Supply to sponsor any more future thrift cons. We will just run the easy booths ourselves to better main control over the situation, which the easy booth is the other one that I was telling you about. Remember when I said there were two different vintage by the pound situations there was this new one called venture supply in the front and then there was the other one in that back corner the easy booth is the one that was in the back corner and i don't mind that one because it's a timed experience um so you get in line they only allow like 20 people in at one time you get to go through these booths and um you have 10 minutes in there to dig as, for as much as you want um for 10 minutes and after that 10 minutes is up you walk out you pay and you leave and that keeps things under control so people can't just spend all their money in there and they're not going to spend the whole day in there. So I don't mind that one. I feel like it still gives you that experience. It gives you the low price point without screwing over everyone else. Um, they also said they will be zip tying the bag shut to help mitigate theft. Um, and they said to continue scaling this thing, we have to offer more and more to our guests. Um, so they come back and so far what we're doing is working. I'm sure it is working. I'm sure you're getting more money. Um, but I'm also positive that it's hindering the sellers. Um, <laughs> my thing with this is that um, this is not supposed to, th it's not supposed to be a thrift convention. And I will die on this hill. ThriftCon is the worst name. Because that signals to other people they see thrift they hear thrift and they think thrift pricing and that's not what this is so to the buyers and the guests they market this as a thrifting convention and they try to keep a lot of things affordable and so that's why they bring in the vintage by the pound but to the sellers and the people in the vintage community they're like this is the largest vintage traveling market in the united states so we are curating the best of the best for this market we're spending so much money on the front end to make sure we come presentable. Like this is our Super Bowl type energy. And it's like you're marketing it to us as this vintage market. So there's a disconnect. And expectations are all over the place. Because we're, we're expecting to have like the true collectors come out and buy these specialty pieces. While the buyers are thinking, oh... It's a thrift convention. I can find some cool stuff at thrift prices at this convention. No, that's why people are upset. You're marketing two different things to two different groups. You need to get everyone on the same page. ThriftCon is the most misleading name ever. And I will die on that hill. I will. Um, I told them that um, as far as that goes, I understand that you want to have different price points i totally get it uh but a lot of us do have five dollar bins at our booths a lot of us do and a lot of us aren't charging 80 to 100 to 400 to 1000 dollars for t-shirts that's just all they market on their social media which again goes back to poor social media marketing because there are so many other sellers but these people don't know that at all because that's not what they put out they make it seem like all they're going to have are these graphic tees that are expensive as hell. And that's not the case. Most of my stuff is 30 and under. And I have a $5 bin. Like my most expensive stuff, it's going to be like leather jackets. Which I think are warranted. It's going to be cowboy boots and stuff like that. Which again, I think are warranted. But other than that, most of my stuff is a 30 and under range. Like it's very reasonable, very affordable. Um, but uh, what, I, what did I say to them? I said, I understand the need for multiple price points, wanting to have the experience, um, but the location was poor. And I feel like you're not hearing me when I say that. At least put it to the back slash to the side 
um, like you did with the Easy Booth, then that encourages people to move towards those booths in the back so those vendors get more exposure. It's not totally killing sales for the people who pay to be prioritized, and the customers are still getting the opportunity to have a cheaper option to shop. Even um, buyers were saying in my comments that having the bins in the front was a wild decision and putting it in the back would make more sense. If both the buyers and the sellers can see that it can see that I find it hard that y'all as a team couldn't think that through, which makes me feel like this was an intentional, again, lacking care for sellers. You saw it as a moneymaker and you ran with it. That's there's a way to find a happy medium for everyone, your company included. I said that verbatim, point blank period. And I stand by that because the location of that bins thing just didn't make sense. If you're gonna do it, do it tastefully, but this was just a big F you to essentially all the sellers. And then I said, um, I said, I think most sellers are fine with you offering more to the guests, just don't do it at our expense, which I feel like I shouldn't have to say that, but you know. Oh, also they did try to say that location um, doesn't impact sellers as much as we would like to think. And I just think that's comical because who do they put in the front? The vintage by the pound and who got the most attention? Vintage by the pound, who got the most money? Vintage by the pound. So you're gonna sit there and tell me location doesn't matter? Please. And they had the nerve to tell me that whoever's emailing me had the nerve to tell me that they were a vendor before they were ever helping manage StuffCon. So as a former vendor, you're gonna tell me that you you never thought that location mattered? What world are we living in? Because now we're lying. <laughs> okay, the last thing I touched on in my other video and like in my survey, whatever, was pricing or not pricing, but like personal numbers because um, people in the past, like I've had friends who live in Atlanta that have been going to ThriftCon forever. I have friends who are in Houston, again, who have been going to ThriftCon forever, who follow ThriftCon around and hit multiple locations every single year. They told me that like 4K minimum was standard for everyone at ThriftCon because it is just like the craziest thing. Everyone's in there buying, selling, all the things. If people in the past were doing 4K minimum a day, people were hitting 12K a day, people were hitting 10K a day, which you can fact check these because people have been bragging in the past on the internet about doing 10K in a day. People were not seeing that this year. Everyone was like, oh, like I should be able to double my numbers or at least do 1.5, you know, times what I normally do. So if I can do 4K on an easy day, you know what I mean? Or like, if I can do 4K minimum in the past, with two days, I should be able to do like 8K for the whole weekend, 6K at minimum for the whole weekend. Some people didn't even do that. My friend who did like 12K in 2021, she barely hit $5,000 for the whole weekend. Like what's going on? I saw another um, person on YouTube he was like, I thought I would be doubling my numbers. I did worse than I did last year, over two days. I was talking to some of the other vendors and they were like, I didn't do any better than last year. I hit the same number, but it was spread out over a two day period. So instead of doing 7K in one day, I hit 7K for the whole weekend. So we paid more this year and people barely made the same amount, if they even made the same amount as they did last year. And it was over a longer period of time. What was the point in having two days? Now, like I said, I've made all my back, my money back and then some. I was expecting to do 3K each day, easy. I barely did 1,500 on the first day. When I tell you, like, the within the first hour, like, we did, er, there's an early bird at 9 and, the, like, general mission comes in at 10. Within that first hour on day one, I made one sale. One because everyone, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm, we're circling back to the, the vintage by the pound, but everyone was over by that vintage by the pound thing. I made one sale. It literally wasn't until technically almost two hours in that you really started to feel people, like the market had gotten started. Because everyone was swarming that vintage by the pound thing and they would just stay for 30, 40, an hour. They would just be chilling in there and then they would slowly tr start to trickle, 
you know, into the curated sections. Like, I thought I was going to be so overwhelmed to the point that I was borderline ready to have a panic attack because it was just so booked and busy. I've done smaller markets where I'm booked and busy and that's what I was expecting from ThriftCon and that's not what I was getting. Like occasionally, like every now and then there would be a wave, but there were also multiple times throughout the day where I just had like maybe two people in my booth. Like what are we talking about? And so I was just like, what is going on ThriftCon? Because, you know, I didn't have a great time in Charlotte. I barely broke even at Charlotte. Um, and I told myself I wasn't going to do Atlanta because I just don't think it's worth it. Um, and everyone was like, no, like Atlanta's so good. Like this is one of the top places to be. Like give it one more chance. Like if you don't like it after Atlanta, then that's fine. But like Atlanta is the true experience. Like Charlotte was not it. Because Charlotte only had like 6,300 people buy tickets and come through, which is very small for ThriftCon. Um, but it was their first time out there. So I was like, okay, fine. Like I'll come to Atlanta. Atlanta was no better. In response to that, they said, this is a tough one for me to approach. I was a vendor before managing ThriftCon full time. So I know a bad day is just a bummer. After each event, I do go around to as many sellers as I can to ask them what the vibe was and how they did. It's always the same. Some did good numbers, some did not so good. Um, opposed to years past when people had savings and less credit card debt, people aren't buying like they used to. I'm a market nerd, so I watch retail trends as much as I can. They aren't as good and will continue to get worse. This has a drastic impact on sales across the US, especially in clothing and luxury purchases. The good news is people still spent upwards of $2 million at this event. The bad news is, is that people are being more selective about their purchases because of what's going on in the world. We don't have control over that. We wish we did. Okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. Let's talk about it. First of all, don't give me the economy bad spiel. I don't need to hear it. I know what the economy is, but I also know that people are going to splurge where they want to splurge. The economy is bad, but people are still getting their nails done. They're still getting their hair done. They're still getting their lashes done. They're still going on vacations. Just because the economy is bad doesn't mean you can't enjoy yourself. Okay? Like, if people want to splurge, they're going to splurge. Do I have any issues online? No, I'm still making steady sales online no issues haven't seen any drop off the economy is still bad online i have gone to another market i literally went to a market right the week after thriftcon i did so well i did over 2k within six hours i didn't even do f i barely did 1500 in the first day on nine hours on day one of thriftcon so i don't think the economy is a good reasoning like that's crazy that you're trying to throw me hit that with me or whatever you know what i'm trying to say like this is just crazy and like i said like big picture i didn't have a bad day at thriftcon it was like an expectations versus reality everyone's like oh i do this amount like easily every single year at thriftcon i thought i had i would have low goals 3k each day i thought that was very reasonable that didn't happen it didn't happen <laughs> um and i was like like explaining this to them uh, even the person that had done 12k a day barely did 5k for the whole weekend it's just like how did things fall off so hard people have been here people that have been going year after year so they could barely walk through the crowds before and this year was so impeccably chill um, multiple guests and buyers commented on my video on tiktok saying that thriftcon was done so poorly this year thriftcon was an awful experience and they need to rethink everything that they've done there was so much empty space i noticed it when i walked in um, and I was just reiterating that it's not just sellers like myself, like even the people, the guests were like noticing this, um, and that there was such a big drop off. And then I, again, told them, I just don't know how you can sit there and say the economy is down, that people are being more selective with their purchases when you supposedly had a record breaking attendance this year. And we saw all those big bags, um, of vintage by the pound pieces that aren't in, and I quote, premium or curated it's it's stained worn rag house stuff that people have to fix and flip spend extra money and time um putting into them to make them usable those were your words if people are so truly being selective um then shopping with a curated seller would make more sense would it not um they get to come in get a few select pieces in good condition that they love 
um, that have been on their wish list forever and then they can just spend the rest of the time socializing. Regardless of the economy, people will splurge where they wanna splurge. My online sales are still flowing strong. Like I said in my video, in my survey, they just blew their budgets too early on with the vintage by the pound thing. They don't realize how fast all that stuff adds up. And then by the time they realize it, um, they're not gonna put anything back. They've already weighed in line, so they're gonna follow through with their purchase. So it's just like, how are you gonna sit there and be like, oh, people still spent upwards of $2 million at ThriftCon. Okay, um, cool. Where's that money going? Because if there were 170 vendors and we all did 10K, that's only, you know, um, 1.7 million. So like, where's the other money? Which plenty of people didn't even hit 5K for the whole weekend. So, and you're talking about people being more selective. Like, I don't know. Like, how are people being more selective if they're spending all that money at Vintage by the Pound? How are people being more selective because the economy is down on what they're going to spend their money on, but you still had a record number of ticket sales? So it's like, is what what's really tea? Like, I just feel like they're giving me these HR, like, responses. And I'm not having it. Like, you're a business. I'm a business. Business is a business. Like, let's let's be so for real. Please, let's 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 be honest here if we're gonna be honest. If we're gonna sit here and you're gonna address my concerns, let's address it. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. I just feel like I was getting a lot of a lot of BS with the whole situation. <sighs> Which is really frustrating. Because this is supposed to be top dog. This is supposed to be our Super Bowl in the Vintage community. I paid seventeen hundred dollars minimum just to be there, to get out there to sell like and you're giving me the runaround like we really just got screwed over 100 percent um and then to finish off their email they said as always we appreciate um yours and everyone else's um contributions contributions to the event we know that all eyes are on us to see how we're going to navigate this industry and sometimes we get it wrong it was never our intention to continue to operate the same year after year um, but to push the limits of what's possible in vintage and secondhand selling because of that we'll probably get some things wrong again um but overall atlanta was a huge success and we're stoked to come back next year to make it even bigger and better we understand our choices may not align with some of our past vendors and but vendors values and that's okay we do hope to see you out again and if you have any other questions comments or concerns we're always open and willing to chat and they said p.s which I haven't told you guys this part yet, but they said, P.S., we never let our founder take from the bank to buy courtside Hawks tickets. He was invited by a high-end client of one of our creators last minute, and he really, really, really loves basketball, so he was gassed to be given the opportunity. It was bad optics for some, and we apologize if it seemed off. So, um, hold on. I just closed out the email on accident. So in my original video on TikTok, when I was like, where's our money going? I did make a little shoddy comment because um, <laughs> off after day one, like on Saturday night, they posted multiple clips on their Instagram story at, of them courtside at the Atlanta Hawks game. So it kind of just was like, is that where my money's going? Because the production of ThriftCon was not giving $200,000 plus budget. It just wasn't the level of care wasn't giving that but they could be courtside at atlanta hawks game so i did make a comment about that and i guess he's addressing it there that he was invited but it's just like you guys ha again you have to be a business how do you think that looks to everyone else those tickets are not cheap to be courtside and if i'm paying all this money and then you post on your Instagram, like, oh, I'm at the courtside. First of all, it looks like you took your whole team to be courtside to at this NBA game is what it looks like. Second of all, if he was gassed to get this opportunity and that's like a personal love he has, then he should have put it on his personal Instagram. It should not have been on the company Instagram because it does not look good. It looks like all that money we paid is going towards that. Like, why did not... That didn't cross your mind at all? Like... ThriftCon is just giving, it's it's a fraternity, it's a frat, and they're all sharing the same brain cells. Um, and I said, in response to that stuff, um, I said, <laughs> look, the market was great beforehand, buyers and sellers agree in my comments that this year just wasn't it. 
the changes didn't make sense for anyone but ThriftCon's pockets. Two days, twice the ticket sales. Two days equals twice the vendor fees, which is more money for you guys. Vintage by supply equals more people in the door, which more, which equals more ticket sales for ThriftCon. Bringing in a celebrity um, in the music industry, more tickets for ThriftCon, um, and more money for ThriftCon. Selfish behavior and, e and big egos are the downfall of every successful business. Um, consistency isn't a bad thing. People quite literally crave it. When you're what you're pushing right now is the limits of everyone's tolerance. Rose Bowl has been doing the same thing month after month, year after year, and people are just as excited every single time. People are even flying in just to experience Rose Bowl. I said there's no reason to overwork things that are already going so well. I said don't forget your roots and remember um, how you got to the level you are. Don't forget about the sellers who made you who you are. Um, I just feel like it, we just need to have a heart to heart right then and there and so that's what I tried to give them and I stand by that like it's like they forget that we are all also business owners and we're all very successful one thing about me I do not play about my money and my time and my energy because I don't do this full-time I'm not a venture seller full-time even if I was I still wouldn't play about that stuff because there's more there are more things I could be putting my time and effort into. I could just go to a smaller market, like one in Huntsville or one in Nashville, where I easily do 2K plus with, without thinking about it. It's less of a vendor fee. I got a 10 by 15 at my last um, market in Nashville and I paid $165 for that. And I did over 2K. It was a quick four hour drive. I could be up there and back on the same day if I really wanted to. It was less gas. Like I'm paying a 10th of the fees to do that market and I'm making more before we even take out the fees i'm making more just in gross profit my my booth was packed the entire time i could be doing smaller markets and making more money like that just makes more sense it just like logistically things have to make sense and i feel like they're totally losing the plot their egos have just gotten way too big and um it's hurting them and i really hope that moving forward like some changes are made i was hoping this would really open up a big discussion like in the vintage community and um you know when i went to that market a week after thrifcon um a bunch of vendors like came up to me and was like hey i saw your video i agree about this this and this after i post the video on tiktok like i again have more vendors and even buyers and guests like in my dms telling me about these experiences that they've had with thrifcon and that have been like not so good and it's just like why has nobody said anything why are y'all putting up with this and that's why i said like they're really just pushing the limits of people's tolerances because apparently people have been fed up with thriftcon but no one said anything no one's spoken out about it and i'm like i appreciate all of you guys backing me up in my thought process and like you're validating all my thoughts and feelings but like i hope on that survey you're telling them all of what you're telling me right now like since you don't want to comment on my actual instagram post you guys don't want to make videos of your own stating your experience like i hope at least in minimum you're saying something on your survey because this is why they continue to get away with stuff because you guys allow it they think they can keep doing it because they can't. because we allow them to do so we are in control of their money at the end of the day, without sellers, there is no thrift con. They need us. And I feel like they've forgotten that. And it's just like every, they're like using scarcity marketing and like they're preying on people's fear of missing out their FOMO because everyone wants to get in, but they only have a select number of spots. They sell it within two minutes. And so it's like people want to do it just because it's hard to get into. And it's like a huge flex to be like, Oh, I got into ThriftCon again. I did ThriftCon again. Which some of these people don't even realize that a lot of us are literally paying to play. We are paying up to make sure we get our spots. That's why we can flex year after year. That's why there's barely any spots that you guys are fighting for. And it sells out in two minutes once it eventually goes to the general public. Because so many of us are just paying for the convenience to not have to fight for it. Like there's so much just like behind the scenes thing that people don't see. And I, I don't know. I just feel like they're... They're just, um, <sighs> yeah, I'm, I need to start closing this out because I'm getting worked up. Because this is not even like talking about the buyers and the clients and the stealing. Should I get into that? Yeah, let's get into that. Okay, so 
enough about the business side of things because as, as you can see i'm pretty worked up about it i think i'm very business savvy um obviously i run my own business it's very successful and i've been like growing like crazy over the last like year and a half um so you know i just feel like maybe it's you know i am a capricorn so maybe it's like that part of me and i don't play about money for my astrology girlies like listen i am <laughs> textbook definition of a capricorn but you know i just i just feel a type of way and i don't think they're doing it right we need we need like a big women's market because i feel like women just think about these things men this is just a giant like boys club and like we're lucky that girls are even allowed in type thing but anyway um as far as the buyers go i have a couple horror stories and i'm gonna share those really quick and then we'll close out this video because i could talk about this forever forever um so first one i want to touch on was this woman who came with her daughter it was like day two they came into my booth around noon hold on let me sorry i'm like going on a trip and i'm supposed to leave at 11 so i have to i'm like keeping track of my time but um so they came in at around noon into my booth this mom like tried on this jacket she really liked it and she was like okay like i want to look around some more before i make like a final decision there's so many of you guys out here and i was like i totally get it so she put it back on the rack she took a picture of like the tag and like the actual item and went on her way and i was like okay cool she comes back she comes back if she doesn't she doesn't fine it was around four o'clock four thirty that she came back around and i was like oh like maybe she's ready to purchase this uh jacket she grabs it off the the rack comes up to me we do half off i said no i'll meet you in the middle the the jacket was 35 she was asking if i would do 17 um i said uh, i'll do 10 dollars off i'll meet you in the middle at 25 she goes we can't do 17 i said no like not for this piece my lowest is 25 um she goes well while i was gone like i looked on poshmark and i was able to find it at 17 so either i can spend that money with you or i could spend it elsewhere and i said okay well if you want to spend that money with me like 25 is my lowest she said i really do want to spend my money with you are we sure we can't end of the day steal do 17 i said no i'm already offering you 10 dollars off if you want to spend that money with me great um, I take all forms of payment. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to shop on Poshmark for this item. She's like, okay, I guess I'll just go to Poshmark since you don't want to do 17. I said, okay, thank you. And I let her put it back and walk out. People, this is not Walmart. This is not Walmart. I do not price match. What, my prices are already reasonable. So for you to come in and say 17 and I offer to meet you in the middle at 25, give you $10 off. It's crazy. And you're going to sit there and disrespect me in front of your kid? This is what you want to teach your kid? You are too old for this. Like, why was she coming into my booth with that energy? And if we really want to sit down and think about it. She goes to Poshmark. She buys that jacket for 17 How much, remind me, how much money is it? Like, how much does it cost to ship on Poshmark? Last time I checked, it was seven ninety seven, which is basically $8.00. So if we do the math, 17 plus 8 gets us where? Everybody, 25 freaking dollars. She could have spent that $25 with me. She could have had the item right then and there. She knows it fits her perfect. She knows the condition is good. She could have had it. She could have spent the 25 with me, been a black woman supporting another black woman, girls supporting girls. But no, she wanted to be petty. And honestly, at the end of the day, it's fine because I want my pieces to go to people who are going to appreciate them. Um, and if you want to disrespect me, like, I don't want to sell to you. I do not need the money. Honestly and truthfully, I will never need the money enough to handle, to tolerate disrespect. Which is why I'm so pissed about ThriftCon and, like, and making this video in the first place. Because I'm not putting up with disrespect just to make money. Like, that will never be me. Never. Um, so I just thought that was crazy. <laughs> like, don't do that. Don't come into my booth with that horrible energy like you're literally too old to be doing that anyway let's talk about the like the college kid that came into my booth so he came into my booth he was going through my five dollar pile he had his big bag from vintage by the pound um he was digging through my five dollar pile found a shirt he liked and he was like i think i want to get this i said cool like i take all forms of payment um he's like wait i want to check your rack so i was like okay he goes over he's looking through my rack 
um, someone else comes up, buys something from me, leaves. He comes back over. He's like, hey, um, will you do five for both of these? It's a cardigan from the 50s that I had priced at 30. And then it was a $5 shirt he got out of the bin. I said, I'm not doing five for both of those. Um, this one is already super reasonable. It's from the 50s, and I have a price at 30, and you already got that one at the five dollar bin. Like, it's $35 for two things. I think that's pretty good. And he was like, well, I only have a budget for $20. So are you sure you can't do five for both? I said, I'm positive. Um, and I said, if you only have a budget for 20, then, like, you can get a couple things out of the five dollar bin if you, like, if you want to spend, you know, your full 20. But, like, I can't do five for both. And he goes, both for seven? I said, no. He goes, both for 12? I said, no. Which, mind you, which I forgot to mention, when he came back over, he had ripped the tag off of that cardigan. Like, I had it priced at 30, and I could still see the plastic remnant of my, like, tagging gun, the thing I put my tag on with. He had ripped it off, and then came over and was like, oh, it doesn't have a price, we do both for five. Like, no. Excuse me. Like, <laughs> Who raised y'all? And he goes, okay, you won't be... We, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the story. But he was like, you won't do both for 12? I said, no. Like, you can get the one $5 item, but, like, I'm not cutting a deal that hard. I'm not. And he goes, okay, let me think about it. He leaves, comes back. He goes, we do both for 30? I said, yeah. Like, I'll meet you there. We can do both for 30. He's like, well, I really don't have 30, so are you sure you can't do both for five? Why did you even say that? Um, and no, I'm not going to do both for five. I said, you can get the one shirt or you can get nothing at all. Like, I don't, but I'm not doing both for 30. And it's like, it comes to the point where you're trying to stay in customer service mode and be very respectful, but at the same time, you're getting disrespected left and right. And it's like, you have to keep your cool, but at the same time, you want to meet their energy. And like, that's another part of like the business aspect of things I feel like a lot of people like don't talk about because these are the most trifling people. Some of the people with the most audacity are these people at their club. And I just don't even know where they get it from but eventually he put the cardigan back and he goes okay well will you one will you run this for three is five dollars not cheap enough you have a huge bag of vintage by the pound stuff you bought all that stuff in there for basically ten dollars a piece minimum and you're mad and you won't do five dollars on this shirt right now like no i'm not gonna run it for three five is so reasonable five is low-key cheaper than some of these thrift stores out here he's like okay fine if you won't do five if you won't do three i guess i can just pay you the five please please just pay me my five and let's in this this encounter because i can't do it because you're really testing me right now the booth next to me was one of my friends someone came into their booth bought a betty boop jacket it was fifty dollars they left did some shopping, came back a couple hours later. I was like, hey, I went over a budget. Can I get a refund for this jacket? Can I return it? My friend was like, no, all my sales are final. And they were like, are you, really? Yes, really, like, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? You went over a budget and you want to refund my jacket? Like, my friend was one of the first things that that person bought. You knew what your budget was, and you still went around and went over your budget. Like, why did you buy some of that stuff on the back end? Don't ask for a refund. It's crazy activity. Two booths down was my friend who said she had done 12K in one day, like, a couple years ago. She does a booth with her boyfriend because they're both, like, sellers. She was in her booth selling as one does, and she has both her parents come to, like, help um, cause she brings so much stuff and she always has issues with people trying to steal. So she was in her booth, you know, helping someone else out and another customer in her booth came up to her and was like, Hey, like, do you know the price of all your stuff? Because I think the two girls in the back corner are trying to switch tags. We're switching tags at a vintage event. Are you joking? What? It's so bad when, like, another customer has to come up to you and be like, hey, girly, those people are trying to steal from you. They're trying to take advantage. Like, shout out to her for, like, pointing it out. But, like, who raised y'all? For real. Why do you think that's okay? I don't care how you feel about vintage sellers and resellers and everything else. Switching tags, not okay. Stealing, not okay. 
any small business not okay you know it's still from walmart i'm not you know advising to steal at all but if you're going to steal steal from someone who's not going to feel that steal from someone who's not going to notice small businesses we we notice okay um and a lot of us run this like by ourselves another person in their booth this girl grabs two shirts and just walks out the booth her boyfriend like follows these two girls um and was like hey those are my shirts and the girl was like oh okay like can i get a bag he was like you didn't even pay for those she goes oh i have to pay again playing dumb not gonna work not gonna work stealing is crazy why do y'all think this is okay and then it's like the moment you confront these people they, they want to be offended like either they're gonna stick to playing dumb or they're gonna be offended i had somebody um in my booth who was like going through my five dollar bin and trying to like slowly just put like slide things into her like big bag that she got from bitches by the pound and when i confronted her on it because i peeped it i was like hey um i saw you put that in your bag like you do have to pay for that she's like what are you talking about i said open your bag like let me see what's in there she's like no like that's my stuff like well like getting offended girl i literally saw you sneak shit in there sorry oh my god i just cussed i told myself i wasn't gonna cuss at all in this video uh, <laughs> i'm so passionate um but it's like i just saw you do it like don't give me that <laughs> like, why are you why are you why are you offended you're stealing from me and you're offended because I asked to look through your bag because you got caught. Okay, because that, that makes sense. You're going to make me the bad guy. Interesting. And it like got to the point where since I was right, right next to my friend, it got to the point where um, people were like trying to part the Red Seas, like move our racks apart and walk through to the booth behind us. First of all, there are aisles. ThriftCon so nicely made them so wide and so empty for everyone. Use them. Why are you trying to squeeze through the rats? Like, clearly, you're not supposed to be taking this path. Sorry, there's a truck outside. But it's like, if you have to force a path, that's not the one meant for you. You should not be pushing racks to sneak into the booth behind me. And you know that when they're doing that, they're just grabbing items off your rack and pulling them off and sticking them in their bag. Like, they're stealing. The amount of times I was like, it was like every 10, 15 minutes I was walking around and I was going through my racks looking for empty hangers. And a couple times I did find an empty hanger, meaning someone stole it. Because just about everyone comes up to me like with their hanger still on the item when they're trying to purchase it. So it's like these people are trying to work your blind spots and just like sneak around and steal. And it's like, this isn't, <laughs> why are y'all doing this? Like. I even had one person trying to shop my my rack through the one behind me. Um, they were in the booth behind me, and all I could see were my clothes moving. And I'm like, I have one person in my booth. Like, why are my clothes moving like that? And so I walk over there because I couldn't see, like, over my rack that there was someone in the other booth. But the moment I got over there, I saw their hands, and they quickly, like, try to pull it away. Acting like I didn't just see them moving my stuff, like, trying to grab my stuff through the other booth. Again, trying to steal. Like, theft is at an all-time high at this ThriftCon. It's like, I put too much time and energy into this to have things be stolen from me. Like, ThriftCon is the only place I've had this issue. And the amount of people that just grab your stuff and then just walk out. Like, every single person is their own shop. You pay that person at the booth. There is not, this is not a department store. You don't go to the front and pay for everything at once. Like we literally all have these on or we have badges on that says vendor. Like why would. You just gotta take a breath, truthfully. Cause it's just like, is this real life? There's no way this is real life. People are just trying to steal left and freaking right. Anyway, I'm sure I have more thoughts and feelings on all of this, but I gotta wrap this up because it's been like a solid hour. The tea was spilt, okay? 
And hopefully, if you're a seller, this kind of opens your eyes to some things. Um, if you're a buyer, a goer of ThriftCon, again, hopefully this opens your eyes to some things. Just be respectful when you go. Um, and just like, I don't know, be mindful. We do put a lot of effort into this, but we're also spending a lot of money to be here. And while we are very, at least a lot of us are very open to negotiations, like, please don't take advantage of us. Um, <laughs> this is not easy. Uh, and it is really expensive. A lot of us are one man shows. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Um, let me think if there's anything else I want to touch on i don't think so i don't think there's anything else i want to touch on um talk to me in the comments though if you have any more questions comments or concerns i'm willing and open open to speaking about it um because i definitely feel a type of way if you couldn't tell um but anyway i have to get ready for this vacation because i did thriftcon which was stressful and then i have nashville the weekend after which was stressful i've got huntsville next weekend which is again stressful so i need a little break so i'm about to head to the mountains in north carolina for a little weekend giveaway giveaway get away with some friends so i'm gonna edit this hopefully get it posted before i head out and then enjoy that and then we'll be back to the reg regularly scheduled content i swear i'm normally this nice sweet bubbly girl but like if you got me messed up you got me messed up and i will speak about it because what i say i'm not going to be disrespected like I put too much into my craft to be disrespected like this. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, hope you live a happy, beautiful, wonderful life. Until I see you guys next week. Nah. And until then, I love you guys so much. Subscribe if you aren't already. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.